Tylea's Troubles, Part 81. A Fair Share. The City of Campagrotta, Autumn, 2403. It was the middle of the morning when Glamourscale encountered the damsel Perrette. As before, her face immediately lit up with a smile and she invited him to walk together a while, which suited him well for it had been his intention to converse with her. His servant, Thaldrin, a short, round fellow with a neatly trimmed beard, fell in behind the two of them as they made their way by the ruined walls of Campagrotta. Along the ragged stretch of tumbled stones were scattered labourers and masons, both dwarfs and men, as well as ladders, piles of wooden planks and other necessaries for the fashioning of scaffolding needed to begin the repairs. Campagrotta had suffered greatly from the attentions of the dwarven artillery, especially the ancient Canon Imperial Granite Breaker. You were hoping to meet with me, Master Glamourscale? suggested Perrette. Aye, my lady, I was. There's much afoot, and I would know your opinions concerning it all. I think, in truth, it is my intentions that most concern you, said the damsel with a grin, and I suspect it is Thane Narak who wants to know. I doubt he was keen to speak to such as I, and so sent you as an emissary. It is no burden for me, my lady, said Glamourscale, but I, the Thane, is most keen to learn of your plans. Master Glamourscale, you are a very poor spy, Perrette said, chuckling. Aye, he agreed, so poor that I had not even realised I was one. Or perhaps you are so good a spy that you can conjure an illusion of honesty and lure me into a false sense of security. I assure you, I always strive for honesty, my lady, said Glamourscale. And so, with that in mind, I'm told you have considerable influence with the Brabans on now, like unto a captain. They behave as if I were a queen, she said, fixing her eyes upon him, channelling a most regal stare, delicately laced with mischief. Glamourscale had witnessed her in action before the walls of Campagrotta, watching her conjured flames broiling the brute's slaughter master. He had heard also how she had tumbled several lead belchers from the wall during the first assault, causing them to explode as they fell. I think, my lady, they have good reason to show you due respect. Perrette laughed at this. If that were the case, then why do they not bow before the mighty Empress Granite Breaker? I may have singed the ogre's flesh a little, but look here. Look at what her massive majesty did. She gestured to the huge fissure in the wall they were passing, as if Glamourscale needed it pointing out. It was his turn to laugh. Ah, but my lady, Granite Breaker, despite her enormous size, is a dwarf, and the Brabant's own would surely never kneel to a dwarf. Their days of kneeling for anything other than money are long gone, said Perrette. What respect they have for me is born of a kind of fear. Is that not the case in many a kingdom? asked Glamourscale. Perrette did not answer immediately, but came to a halt. She watched a pair of Brabanzon soldiers walk by, acknowledging their bows by gesturing with her fan, then seemed caught in a moment's reverie. Now that both the wolf and Jean are dead, she said, as well as their favourites, the survivors have elected me captain. If you and Saint Marhac are surprised to hear this, then I assure you that I am more so. I knew they had shaken off the yoke of vassalage to the nobility, but in choosing me, it appears they care for very few of our homeland's traditions. Are you not honoured by this turn of events? I suppose, in some ways, they no longer pester me like they used to. Yet I cannot say I am pleased by this turn of events. Responsibility does not sit comfortably on my shoulders. I am glad to say I, I never had much responsibility, beyond a few servants to command and apprentices to instruct, admitted Glamourscale. If it means anything to you, my lady, I think the Bramazon have chosen wisely. Perrette gave a little curtsy, saying, I thank thee, good master dwarf. So, she captain of the Brabanzon, now that you have been paid what was promised, and your soldiers have had their desire for plunder sated, I must ask, Will you go to Revola with the wounded baron? He has asked, and I have promised to put it to the men. We are a very democracy, you see, when it comes to such decisions. Although in battle, 
with no time for votes, I think they would obey me without hesitation. You spoke with Baron Garroy then? asked Lammerscale. No, he sent one of his chevaliers to make the proposal. I asked the man if the Baron was recovering well, but he simply said he had yet to get over the worst of it. Do you, Master Glamourscale, know if Garroy is likely to live? He is being tended day and night by the sisters of Chalier, directed by the best doctor remaining in the city. Glamourscale hesitated a moment, then admitted, In truth, I suspect the fellow is probably the only doctor in the city. Still, the Baron is young, and the doctor assured me the break was simple. He still has the leg. He might walk forevermore with a limp, but what Bretonian knight chooses to walk anyway? Well, his messenger had little to say, and could not answer at all when I asked him about the terms of the proposed employment. I doubt the Baron himself has considered such details yet. Do not concern yourself. He'll be fit to talk long before he's fit to travel, and so there'll be plenty of time for such discussions. Perrette fanned herself a moment. Then, with a wry smile, asked, I wonder if he'll receive me in his chambers for our negotiations. Glamourscale knew there was a joke in there somewhere, but could not for the life of him work out how to ask without risking great offence. Had she been intimate with the young baron on their journey here? Was she suggesting she might become so? Or was it some reference to his arrogant nobility and her dubious past? He decided to play it safe and talk about the baron's chamber instead. The Baron is comfortably lodged in what they say was Wizard Lord Niccolo's chamber. I believe he has the largest bed in the city. I wonder if the brute Bolagots use the same bed. I doubt even that bed would have been sufficient capacity for the likes of him. This Wizard Lord Niccolo, asked Perrette, has he been found? Glamourscale frowned. No, he has not. Nor is there any clue he ever was here in Campagrotta. Very mysterious sort of man, I have to say, for the supposed ruler of a city realm. The chamber in question contained no personal possessions and was buried beneath so much dust and cobwebs it cannot have been used in some considerable time. And it seems he had neither courtiers nor servants to tend to his needs. I asked some citizens, said Perrette. They talked of him, his tyranny and cruel proclamations. One of them told me he treated them no better than the ogre's goblin runt servants. But they never saw him, not once. They spoke of a friend of a friend who saw him, or a neighbour's nephew, and so on, but none claimed personally to have laid eyes upon him. Glamourscale had heard much the same. Only the previous day, Thane Nahak suggested Niccolo must have been as old as it was possible for a man to be, and maybe a little older than that, and as such would hardly have been able to address the crowds, never mind inspire fear in them. Besides, the Thane had added, Niccolo had the ogres to do the frightening, and everything else too. The man did not have to leave his rooms. Yet none of this rang true for Glamourscale. Although he had said nothing at the time, he was beginning to think that there was something everyone was missing concerning the Wizard Lord, and not merely the unused chamber. There had long been rumours that Lord Niccolo was a vampire, thus his unnatural age. Several Tylians had suggested there must be an alliance between the vampire duchess and Niccolo, such that while the brutes tore their way through the heart of Tylia, the vampires could conquer the north. Despite being close neighbours, they had conveniently stayed out of each other's way. Although Niccolo had sent a company of brutes and the last of the Campagrotta's human soldiers to join Archlector Calictus II's holy war against the vampire duchess, at the same time he dispatched Razga Boldaguts to ravage the homes of the soldiers in that same army hardly the actions of a true ally in the fight against the vampires. Glamourscale was not at all convinced of this theory. Vampires might shun the daylight, but not the night time too. They needed blood, and when they ruled a realm, they would not be shy in the drinking of it, and when made mighty by their sanguine sustenance, they need not hide every moment in the shadows. Nor did they surround themselves with brute ogres, instead siring other vampires for their courts and resurrecting the dead for their armies. There was definitely something more to the Wizard Lord, something Glamourscale could not put his finger on. He noticed the two Brabazon who had passed them by had come to a halt by a doorway, far enough away that they could not hear what he said. My advice, should you wish to take it, my lady, is to get more than gold from the Baron for your continued service. Without the Brabazon, 
he could do nothing now. What few ogres are said to remain in Evola could easily defend the city against what few knights there are left for him to command. If your assistance is required to make his conquest even possible, then you and the men of the Brabazon should expect to receive land also. You deserve a means to live and thrive, if you wish it. It seems to me that you dwarfs think of us as seeds to be planted, so that, come harvest time, there will be profit to be had. Glamourscale chuckled at this. Profitable trade is good, I cannot deny it. And yes, it is better to have strong neighbours as future allies than rat-infested ruins. But many Brabanzon fell before the walls of Campagrotta. Those who survived deserve more than mere gold. There is good soil and sturdy homes to be had in Rivola. It is a chance for old soldiers to live well. Then there is more for us to vote upon. If the men do want it, then I shall demand it of the Baron. Fixing eyes upon him once again, she asked, You speak of prosperous neighbours, Master Dwarf. What of Campagrotta itself? Now that his army has taken the city, is King Jaldiog not truly here? Oh, no, my lady. Our king has no desire whatsoever to possess this city. But like I said, and the king agrees, trade is good. Ravola is like a little part of Bretonia in Tylea. But Campagrotta was always thoroughly Tylean. Its future has already been decided upon. The Compagnia del Sole, being mostly Tyleans, are to govern here, as part and parcel of their payment. Perret snorted. I suppose it costs a lot to replace their shoes. Glamourscale need not ask to what she was referring. The Compagnia had arrived too late to join in the assault upon Campagrotta, and now that it was becoming clear that Rasgaboldegus was unlikely to return to reclaim the city, their service was turning out to be all marching and no fighting. They fulfilled their contract he said, and we have paid them, part in gold and part with the rule of Campagrotta. They might have accepted Campagrotta alone if your Brabazon had not already removed so much of worth. Only that which we were promised, Master Glamourscale. Aye, my lady, well and good. I'm not suggesting any wrongdoing on your behalf, not at all. Both your company and the Compagnie del Sole have received proper recompense. Perrette looked around, shrugged, then asked, where are the new rulers, then? They'll be here tomorrow. Right now, Captain Bruno Mazzolini is swearing an oath before the statue of the goddess Mamidia in Buldio, where the Battle of the Fog was fought centuries ago. All the Compagnia's officers and chancellors are to swear too. It must be quite the ceremony, drums, colours and all the military rigmarole that suits such a solemn and binding oath before the goddess. Thane Marhak is himself present to bear witness. Swear what exactly? asked Perrette. That for three years Captain Mazzolini and his officers shall govern Campagrotta as agents of King Jaldiog's will, heeding His Majesty's advice and instructions, doing all that they can to make the city realm prosper, after which time the city will become theirs entirely, in permanent friendship with Karak Borgo. Not Sir King's vassals? No, as his allies and trading partners. You see... Who better than an army of veteran soldiers to defend this city in such a time of troubles? My advice to them was the same I gave to you. So you are planting more seeds of another variety, Master Dwarf. Let's hope they grow into something more than weeds. I like to think that whatever grows here and in Rivola, it has to be far more fruitful and pleasant than the brutes we have driven out.'